Thank you very much for, for joining us. So my name's Laura Cockrum and I lead the policy and campaigns team at Parkinson's UK. And um, today we're, we're joined um, by Dr. Donald Grossett um, and we're just going to be doing a Q&A of questions that the Parkinson's community have been sending in over the last couple of days about coronavirus and Parkinson's. Um, Donald, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and, and, and tell us about your, um, your, your kind of uh, skills and knowledge with the, the condition? Yes, thanks very much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and speak to everybody. And as, as you'll hear, um, we, we've got a number of questions that have been submitted and many of them in this current um, situation are focused on COVID-19, but some aren't and we'll, we'll just cover both of these. So my background is um, I'm a neurologist and I'm based in Glasgow and um, I've been working in Parkinson's for well over 20 years, uh, running Parkinson clinics, um, working with a team, specialist team, as most of the clinics do with specialist nurses and physios and other um, support staff. And um, I've, I've really specialised in Parkinson's uh, within neurology and done a lot of work in terms of research and have worked with Parkinson's UK over um, several years. And, and currently I, I'm in this position of um, clinical director of the UK Parkinson's Excellence Network. And this is a fantastic network of clinicians across the different disciplines, the medicine and the medicine for the elderly, neurology, um, and the specialist nurses, and again, the therapists, occupational physio, speech and language therapists, and uh, some other linked disciplines as well. So we've got this network and we're using this network presently uh, to support this unforeseen event as well. So it's really on that background that uh, I'm here to uh, speak to you today and, and to help answer these questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Donald. And, and just to, to say thank you as well um, to everybody for submitting their, their questions. So just to, to go on to, to the first question. Um, so why isn't Parkinson's considered in the highest vulnerable or at risk group? Um, Donald, what's, uh, what's, what's your response to, to that one? Well, we've got to think about two risks here. And um, the first risk is, is that of catching COVID-19. Um, and the second is of if you do catch it, what are the risks of developing complications? Um, because as a reminder, um, the majority of people, 80% plus of people who get COVID-19, actually it's a mild illness and, and it, um, it heals itself. Um, so we've got to think about these two risks and then we've got to think about Parkinson's. So firstly, the risk of catching COVID-19. Well, there's no real reason why Parkinson's um, gives an increased risk of catching uh, COVID-19. Um, and then we've got to think of, in Parkinson's, what about the risks of complications should you get COVID-19 and you have Parkinson's? Um, and that, the answer to that is possibly, and I'll come back to that um, in a moment, but just to talk about the groups that are in the highest risk and try and really compare and contrast Parkinson's to these other conditions where people have been put into this highest vulnerable or at risk uh, grouping. So that's back to the same two things, catching it or developing complications from it. And there are conditions where unfortunately it's, it's both an increased risk of catching COVID and developing complications. Some it's an increased risk of catching, some it's an, a, a definite uh, and, and severe risk of developing complications. And the kind of conditions that are in this highest risk category are people with a, a weakened immune system, with a severe diagnosis um, in which there's some cancers, uh, people with transplants, um, um, not all, but some transplants, people with severe asthma, not just regular asthma, and it's kind of equivalent of COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in, this, in its severe form. 
Um, and sometimes it's the diagnosis and sometimes it's the treatment. And the treatments are really those that dampen the immune system. Um, and that's particularly the case if the underlying condition needs more than one of those uh, treatments that dampen the immune system. So um, against that, thinking of Parkinson's, well, the immune system's fine in Parkinson's. And the treatment isn't dampening the immune system for Parkinson's. So that's why Parkinson's isn't in the highest risk group. It doesn't have the weak immune system. Um, it's not at, at so much risk. But I said I would come back to, and I said possibly, in terms of complications. Well, um, most people with Parkinson's don't have this, but in, in more advanced Parkinson's and more severe Parkinson's of many years duration, there may be some problems with breathing and, and swallowing. It's not that common. Um, but if the Parkinson's is involving the muscles for breathing and, and weakening them a bit, it could increase the risk somewhat of complications because as we know, COVID-19 really goes for the lungs and causes a, a pneumonia. It's a viral pneumonia, so different from the, the common type of pneumonia that we, we think about, which is a bacterial pneumonia, but it's still an inflammation in the airways and that makes you breathless. So if the Parkinson's is um, severe um, or has been there for many years, uh, then the and, and is causing some breathing difficulties, or if there are other conditions alongside Parkinson's, so um, an asthma diagnosis alongside Parkinson's. Um, so that could be a milder asthma and a quite advanced Parkinson's. Together, these are going to increase the risk of complications. But most Parkinson's then is not in the severe category and would be grading uh, Parkinson's in, in the moderate category uh, for the majority of people. Okay, thank, thank you for that, Donald. And I think that's a really important answer to get for, for the Parkinson's community and um, some, some really good insight into why that, that, that um, decision or, or kind of category for, for Parkinson's has, has been made. Um, so, so another question that we had in is uh, around self-isolating. So what do I do if I'm self-isolating and I got, can't get to the chemist? Um, we obviously know that Parkinson's medications are really important for, for people with the condition um, in terms of uh, controlling symptoms and we know that many chemists are offering um, a delivery service at this point in time so what we're suggesting is that you make contact with your local chemist um, to, to check whether they can deliver. Um, we know that there will be, uh, be, or rather be aware that there could be some charges that, that are being uh, applied to, to those deliveries. If you can't get through to your chemist, um, have you got a neighbour or a friend that lives close by who may be able to pick up your, your medications? And um, you probably would have heard that there's uh, that the NHS volunteering scheme um, has has um, signed up over 700,000 volunteers in England. There's a similar scheme in in Scotland and and, and Wales. Um, so what we're suggesting is is that you get in contact with your council, who are directing local volunteers to assist with picking up medication, food shopping, and 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 that kind of um, that kind of activity. Um, the, the other thing to say is, is if you can't get that support then do contact our, our own helpline. So that's the Parkinson's UK helpline. Um, that telephone number is 0808 800 0303 and um, what we're suggesting is that as a, an organisation we're, we're trying to find um, uh, a way of, of uh, connecting local um, local staff and local volunteers up with um, people who do need that that support to collect um, medication and, and other things so so please do contact our helpline for that that kind of practical support and, and advice um, so moving on to, to the next uh, question for, for you Donald actually is um, I'm due a medication review, but my appointment has been cancelled. Um, what do I do? Okay, thanks, Laura. So I think the first uh, and overriding message is don't 
don't panic about this. Um, don't don't allow anxiety to cause more trouble. Um, some people with Parkinson's we know have anxiety as as a symptom, and the present situation is anxiety provoking, and we know a lot of people. Uh, I was going to say enjoy um, their their review. They, well, they, they they welcome their review to just get a check up, and um, and yet in truth, a lot of that check up is routine, and it's it's one of the things that I always say to the trainees who are coming through um, is that just because somebody with Parkinson's is in the clinic doesn't mean you need to make a change in the medication or an adjustment of anything. If things are doing fine, um, leave well alone. Now, that's actually the case in the majority of um, situations at Clinic Review, because uh, we've quantified this. Um, so we're going through and checking a number of things, but we're not actually doing anything different at the end of the consultation. So I, th I think my first message with this is it's a bit like the management of milder COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, so the recommendation is you, you read about this and learn about this and manage it yourself. And here, and we'll, we'll come back to this um, later about what's happening in terms of um, the health service at the moment and, and staffing. Appointments may well have been cancelled because your team or, or one or two of your doctors or nurses have um, been redeployed to help elsewhere uh, due to the pressures created by, by COVID-19. So self-managed to an extent here. Um, how is your Parkinson's? Take stock of that. Um, don't let anxiety take over and make you think that you're worse than you really are. Um, we know that can happen. Um, but if you are struggling and if you had thought at this next review that you were going to ask about an adjustment because your symptoms had um, increased significantly, then of course you can still seek advice. Um, you can seek advice in other ways than uh, attending for an appointment um, and that could be contacting your specialist team by telephone or other method if you've got one. Um, uh, or or contacting your GP for guidance. So um, yeah, just um, certainly don't panic about it. We don't know how long the situation is going to last, so we will get back to normal eventually. And um, if you miss one review, most people are getting reviewed every six months approximately, uh, some less than that. Um, depending how the setup is locally. But if you miss one review, uh, we would expect that you get, get your next review as routine in six months and, and this situation will have largely resolved by then. Okay, thank, thank you for that, Donald. So um, a really clear message about not panicking, making sure that um, if you do have any queries to contact your specialist team or even your, your GP. So again, thank, thank you very much for, for that. Um, so another question that came in from, um, from, from people over the weekend is what happens if I go into hospital at the moment? Are there any special considerations I need to be aware of? Um, I think the most important thing that everybody with Parkinson's needs to uh, prepare for if you go into hospital is taking all of your medications with you, not just your Parkinson's ones, but all of your medications in the original packaging, if you've got it, with all of your specific, specific timings. Um, when, when you get your prescription, uh, you usually have a printout of all of your medications taking that or a photograph of that in is, is a really good way of being able to track all of your medications and making sure that you know, as I say, what time um, you take those. It's important to, to kind of have that with you. Um, if you do go into hospital, let your professionals um, treating you know if you have had deep brain stimulation, because um, again, it's just something that they will need to know in, in terms of the course of treatment that they are providing you. Um, at this point, as, as most people will be aware, um, extra visitors, extra people in hospital, um, 
is 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 not allowed and so um so 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 you probably won't have any any visitors um at, at this point in time um again just to make sure that that hospitals can treat um people uh as as um quickly and, and effectively as, as possible and also to, to stop the spread of any germs. Um, if you can inform your GP or your Parkinson's nurse that you're going into hospital, that's, that's really helpful for, for them to be able to, to follow up and to, to kind of know where you are in the system. And um, just really a plug for information we've got on our website about how to prepare when you go into hospital. It does have emergency um, uh, uh, information in, in there as well, um, which is, is, is obviously useful for, for, for the COVID um, outbreak. Um, so all you need to, to, to check is the, the, the coronavirus or use the coronavirus um, coronavirus link on our homepage parkinsons.org.uk and um, there's information on um, that link about going into to hospital. Okay, so um, we, we've got a, a, another query for, for, for you, Donald. Uh, my mum passed away in November. Her cause of death was given as old age, but I felt it should have been Parkinson's. If Parkinson's isn't given as the cause of death, how can this condition be monitored and measured? Thank you. So obviously it's a more general question and, and it's from November, but uh, of course it's... Um, it's a sad time and our condolences um, about your mum passing away and having Parkinson's uh, and it's still early stages of, of the bereavement process and uh, it's, it's nice of you to to put this forward and um, and express concern about this uh, in the research side I, I'm quite passionate about uh, getting as accurate information as we can about Parkinson's and knowing people who have it and then die with it is important for that. Um, I, I think though that uh, we know about issues with coding, there's, um, there's a whole science really about coding of, of death certification and it's absolutely not the only source of information about whether someone had uh, Parkinson's or not. Um, there's a number of other sources of information that would be used to code when we're analyzing how many people get Parkinson's and how long they live with Parkinson's and uh, so on. And um, increasingly, um, not as fast as I would like, but increasingly we've got joined up systems that are helping to build a better picture. Uh, one of the very good things we've got um, it, by the nature of uh, how it's organized nationally is prescription data. Um, so that's very well recorded and computerized and it's possible to um, extract information from that that uh, shows a person had Parkinson's. Just the, the type of drugs chosen. Um, sometimes Parkinson drugs are used for other diagnosis, uh, but you can look at the dose and what happened over time and uh, you can work that out. So that, that helps. Um, that's a proven method that helps to identify people with Parkinson's. And the second um, is about hospital records and hospital admissions in particular are coded. Um, every hospital admission at the point of discharge is coded, uh, including um, a main diagnosis and other diagnosis um, on there. So. Uh, I suppose we, you could say we, we, we don't just depend on one source of data, um, we use a combination and it would depend on the research question, um, but it certainly um, it's, it's not just death certificate data that we uh, depend on to understand Parkinson's. Okay, thank, thanks for that, Donald. So, so just to, to kind of follow up with that, with that question, um, important that we, that we uh, get data on, on, on Parkinson's um, and, and, and how can we use that data in, in terms of accurate and improved kind of coding to um, change our services and to improve our services? What are the kind of things that, that, that the Excellence Network is doing to, to try and improve 
um, Parkinson's services in, in that respect. So um, we, what, what we want to do is have specialist teams who know all their people with Parkinson's and um, who have a system for uh, reviewing the, um, how their Parkinson's is doing and making sure the medication is optimized. And um, really that's built on, on the backbone of NHS referrals in from primary care. And uh, um, again, I, I think in general terms, one is learning a lot more about Parkinson's from people who have it and attend services than, than just from information on death certificates. As I said, it depends slightly on the nature of the research. And if we're looking at um, how many people have Parkinson's versus how many people have Alzheimer's disease, it might be, and a whole range of other diseases, it might be the case that one started off looking purely at death certificate data to, to begin to answer that question. But um, we would never stop there and accept that that was the accurate uh, statistic about that. We would always be looking at um, all those other sources of data to, to, um, to do uh, a proper quantification. Okay, thank, thank you for, for, for that, Donald. Um, so uh, one of the queries that's, that's come in um, is from, from uh, an individual whose mum's appointment with a consultant um, has, has been cancelled a number of times over a period of 12 months. She needs her medication doses adjusting. Can her GP alter her doses? So obviously um, the first thing to say is that that's unfortunate about keeping getting cancelled. There are um, checks in the system to prevent serial cancellations, um, but there can be um, unusual circumstances where, where this keeps happening. Um, and, and I don't know the detail in this instance as to why that has kept happening. Um, but I think, uh, the, there are a few possible options here. So firstly, it's possible that the next steps are already flagged in the, um, in, in the person's mum's record. In, in other words, the communication from the hospital to the GP, which happens at each visit, may already give some indication about where treatment it, it would head next in the event of um, uh, a need. Um, so if that's there, then the GP can immediately uh, look at that and help address that, uh, a kind of what next scenario. Now, I, I can't promise that will be there. It, it often is, but it might not be. Um, the, uh, we would need to think about what about others in the, in the team there. So it's an appointment with a consultant, but um, is that consultant available via their secretary? Is someone else in the team? Is there a specialist nurse that's in that team? Or even a specialist nurse not in that team, but in that hospital? Um, these are other sources of information. And then the question was specifically about can the GP alter the dose? The answer is generally going to be yes, that's possible. And another thing that a GP can do, of course, is, um, is to contact the specialist uh, themselves directly. Um, and that happens, that happens by writing a good old fashioned letter or using our modern electronic communication systems or, or making a phone call. So all of these are potential options. Um, so it, it slightly depends on the circumstances here. It, it, is it keeping any cancelled because the consultant is on sick leave and there isn't a replacement? Or is the consultant available but uh, has dropped clinic appointments for other reasons? Um, there, so there, there certainly should be options, including the GP altering the dose to, to help things. Uh, accepting here what's said that the medication doses need adjusting. They, they need reviewed over time with Parkinson's and if they need adjusting, there are other ways of doing that than only uh, through appointments with a consultant. 
Okay, thank, thank you, Donald. So, <clears throat> excuse me, again, really, really clear advice to get in contact with um, the consultant um, or, or Parkinson's nurse if, if they're able to, to prescribe and, and, and change the, the dose, but certainly the GP is a key person to, to contact in, in, in that, okay. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, so one actually for Parkinson's UK. So what a Parkinson's UK doing to provide information and advice on what um, we can do while in isolation. So what are we doing that's above and beyond the, the government advice? Um, so I think it's, it's fair to say that, that um, we've had a, a bigger influx in um, calls to our helpline so we're taking over 200 calls to our helpline every day, but please do continue to, to call in. So our helpline number, just in case um, you, you don't have it to hand, is 0808 800 0303. So we're trying to increase the capacity, so the number of helpline advisors that can answer people's queries and provide advice and support um, at this particular time. Um, we also know that people are finding it more difficult to get the practical support in their communities, especially those who may be in self-isolation. So, for instance, getting um, things like grocery shopping or, or understanding when um, their local pharmacies are, are open. And again, our helpline um, can provide you with this kind of practical help um, locally. So, so as I say, please, please do call us. Um, we're working on getting colleagues across the UK primed and ready to help find the resources that people with Parkinson's need locally. Um, and we're trying to, to kind of improve that local knowledge to, to support people with the condition. Um, where we know that uh, there are particularly vulnerable people in their community, um, so either through local groups or from existing contact that our, our local advisors have, um, our local advisors are making welfare calls, checking in on people and just really trying to make sure that they're okay and that they're signposted onto everything they might need at this moment in time. Um, to keep people active and well and, and safe while um, people are um, at home uh, and, and you know following the government's advice. Um, we've been working with um, Parkinson's physios to develop some new resources so that people can exercise safely and effectively at, at home. Um, it, it will include more links to online exercise classes that are already happening that are suitable for people with Parkinson's and also we're, we're trying to figure out ways to, to get this information out to people who aren't online as well because we know that they may want to, to stay active. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago we launched um, a new Facebook community support group We've got over a thousand members um, already across the UK who are already offering support and advice to and, and friendship to each other as well, which is which is fantastic. So please do go onto our Facebook um, uh, Facebook page and, and, and join up to, to that new group. Um, and you will already see that, that we've been um, putting content onto our web pages around um, government advice. We've been seeking advice from Donald and, and his colleagues, um, uh, Parkinson specialists, to make sure that the advice is tailored for people living with Parkinson's as well. So please do keep um, checking our, our Facebook. Um, please do keep checking our website, Parkinson's parkinsons.org.uk for kind of the latest up-to-date information around um, uh, living with Parkinson's and, and coronavirus. Um, so another question that we've had in Donald's uh, is, um, I'm a nurse and my partner has Parkinson's. I'm worried about giving him the virus. What can I do? Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I mean, it, I think the first thing is that um, we've seen from in Italy in particular as, as having reported this of an increased risk of healthcare workers um, including nurses developing COVID-19 but of course um, nurses are such an essential part of continuing to care for everybody in hospital and uh, I'm assuming this is a hospital nurse uh, from what's been said 
Um, but the, the same principles would apply if it was a community nurse. Um, it's an essential role. It, it's a, a key worker status. And obviously at work, I don't really need to say this to a nurse um, at all. Um, it's more likely a nurse would remind me, follow all the rules um, of personal protective equipment and hand washing. Everybody's doing that extraordinarily rigorously in the healthcare setting. Uh, of course, the, the, the risk is, the biggest risk here is the asymptomatic period. So we know that that can be several days. So you, you, you catch the virus, but you don't develop symptoms for an initial period. And during that time, you can be infectious. And um, I think that really trying to apply some of these uh, professional approaches at home, um, extending that a little bit into the home environment could be helpful here, um, just in terms of, uh, we know this virus can um, lurk on uh, solid surfaces, uh, a bit of reduction of the risk of that, of transferring from objects and um, uh, possibly adopting the kind of um, approach of uh, using a separate bathroom if you've got one, or if you don't, using the bathroom second and then doing a, a kind of, um, uh, wipe down. And I, I also think, talk about it um, for the nurse, talk about it at home. Um, how much can you adjust? Uh, it slightly depends how the person's managing with their Parkinson's. Um, how much can you adjust? How much do you want to adjust? I, I think the message would be that the risk here is, is, is um, it's not a massive risk. There is an increased risk, but not a massive one. And um, it's such an important role, the nursing role. So it's it's uh, one of life's worries, but it's not a huge worry. And again, I mean, maybe I could I could fall on a discussion I've had. I, I've contacted two of my colleagues' counterparts in Italy. One in the northern part, where um, the situation has been more most severe. Uh, so in in the Venice sort of area, and another in in the uh, Rome area. And um, uh, fortunately, um, the, and, they, and they're involved with uh, the care of um, many hundreds of people with Parkinson's. Fortunately, they've not seen, um, despite all these news reports we're seeing about just how bad the situation has been, particularly in North Italy, they've not seen this uh, affecting their Parkinson population. Um, I, I think perhaps because they've been more isolated from the beginning of this and haven't been so likely to get it. Um, so that, that's somewhat reassuring. Okay, thank you for, for that, Donald. So really the, the advice that the government is, um, is, is, is giving that, that you're kind of really endorsing is making sure that uh, we, we, we keep um, kind of washing our hands um, as, as frequently as possible. Um, and if you are sharing a space with somebody who is a health service worker, making sure that you are, are washing it down and, and, and kind of cleaning that after they've used it, just to, to kind of keep the contamination um, as reduced as, as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a kind of a general question now about um, Parkinson's nurses and uh, why is there still a postcode lottery on support across the country? Some people receive fantastic care and I can't get a Parkinson's nurse appointment. Um, so I think it's I think it's fair to say that as uh, as an organisation, um, Parkinson's UK um, has been uh, I think really at the forefront of funding and supporting Parkinson's nurses um, uh, into into kind of being in existence across the whole of the NHS. It does mean that um, that we we work very closely with health bodies across the UK to make sure that people have access to the right services to support them with their condition and that does mean that in some areas that there, there may be um, there may be gaps in services and we are identifying those areas and working with those providers to try and make sure that the, the, um, the service 
is uh, is high quality and um, that, that any interventions can be put in to improve the quality of services. Um, Donald knows very well about the, the, the audit that, that we do um, of Parkinson's services that has, has shown some real improvements in services provided to people with Parkinson's um, over the last couple of years but we know that there is still more to do to make sure that people with Parkinson's can access the full range of Parkinson's professionals um, as, as Donald mentioned earlier on physiotherapists, um, uh, occupational therapists, as well as speech and language therapists. Um, so, so we are working, as I say, with NHS bodies across, um, across the, the UK and with providers in very local areas to try and improve those services. Um, at the moment, we know that there will be changes to services, so we won't be campaigning in quite the same way that, that, that we would do um, if there wasn't an outbreak. Um, but do contact us as the policy and campaigns team if you are struggling with access to, to your services in, in the future. And we can support um, uh, people in their communities to campaign and, and really demand the services that they should be receiving. Um, our email address is campaigns at parkinsons.org.uk and our telephone number is 0207 963 9349. Um, but as Donald said earlier on, at the moment we're working really closely with Parkinson's professionals across the UK um, through the Excellence Network to make sure that they have the resources that they need at this time to make sure that people with the condition are getting the support they need. Um, what, uh, another question that we've had in um, is around the availability of Parkinson's drugs. Um, so somebody asked, I feel very anxious about the availability of drugs. Are stocks high? Um, I've never been so, I never thought I would say I was pleased, I would be pleased uh, to, to say something around Brexit, but um, at the end of January, uh, pharmaceutical companies across the, 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 the UK had been building their stocks up um, and uh, we know that there have been some problems with accessing Cinemet and generic co dopa but um, the, the, at the end of January, um, uh, MSD, who produced Cinemet, had, um, had really uh, gone over and above to get stocks in to make sure that uh, they were meeting the needs of, of, of the Parkinson's population. Um, so I think actually having those preparations in place for Brexit has helped to be able to respond to um, the, the current situation that we're in. Um, we, we're regularly speaking with the Department of Health and pharmaceutical companies about Parkinson's medication stocks and so far we're, we're pleased to, to know that there, um, there have been reports that, that Parkinson's meds are in good supply. We know that there are some localised supply issues in, in some areas because people with Parkinson's have been calling in and letting us, um, letting us know. So they've been calling our helpline. And what we've been doing is trying to marry up those reports with the Department for Health and with the pharmaceutical companies to really try and understand what the, the, the supply issue is and if there is a problem. Um, so, so what I'd suggest is if you are having issues getting hold of your medication, call into our helpline and that's 0808 800 0303 um, and, and let us know where you live, the, the medication that, that you're struggling to, to get and then we can um, make contact with the, the company to see if we might be able to uh, help the, the, the situation or kind of get some stocks moved around. Um, just to say, it is important that you continue to order your prescriptions as normal. Um, you may want to, to order them a couple of days early just so that they get through the system, um, but, but continue to order your medication as, as you usually would. Donald, I don't know if there was any, um, any further advice that you wanted to, to, to kind of add on, on that. 
Well, just to add to that, the general advice is that um, prescriptions aren't being extended. GPs aren't sort of routinely extending prescriptions. I think there was a, um, a question at, at one point about whether um, prescriptions might be doubled in length, and the answer is no. Um, there isn't a need for that, and in fact, um, that that would cause potential. If everybody did that, that could cause potential problems at off stock levels, and and is equivalent of the unfortunate sort of stockpiling we've seen happening a little bit with some products in the supermarket. So, um, as as you said, Laura, there isn't a, a general supply issue. Um, and one final remark about that, there are substitutes for um, drugs. So if one particular name isn't available or strength isn't available, there are uh, ways in which we can um, keep medication flowing. We, we absolutely know how important it is for people with Parkinson's to keep their medication maintained. And um, there are, we've been through this for many years with um, supply issues of of a limited sort and, and know our way through that uh, if, if that should happen. Thank, thank you for that Donald. Um, so a question for, for you, a very specific question um, from, from a member of our community. Um, so they, they asked, um, I have Parkinson's plus Crohn's disease and had a thyroidectomy. I've not received a letter from the government. Um, I am a key worker at a supermarket, but they won't give me full pay until I can present my letter. I don't want to go to work and risk my health. What should I do? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so that, that, that's quite specific, but I, I'll address the specific um, points in as much as I can. So the first thing is it depends on the severity of these individual conditions and the, the severity of Parkinson's, which I've talked about earlier, um, that by and large that uh, somebody who's keeping working won't by, be in the um, severe advanced uh, complicated stage of Parkinson's almost by definition. And then, then there's the Crohn's, and I'll come back to that. And then there's the thyroid. The, the person, the questioners had thyroid surgery. Uh, generally, that's, that will be because there's been an overactive thyroid gland before, so part of it is removed. And then um, the general result of that is the person runs a bit short of thyroid hormone, and tablets are given to top that up. So I think we can assume on the general principles that the thyroid is not not relevant to the question really. Um, so that's one. Um, Crohn's then, it's not on the severe list by itself, um, but it depends how severe it is. Um, and that links back to the point about treatment for suppressing the immune system. Crohn's is a system, is a, is a condition where there's um, an overactive, immune system causing trouble in, in the gut, in the bowel. And um, it can be a varying degrees of severity and it sometimes needs surgery and it can sometimes at the severe end need these treatments that dampen the immune system. And uh, this actually led me to seeing a different support organization called Crohn's and Colitis um, UK where there's a lot of information about this and uh, which severities of Crohn's would put the person to the severe category. Um, and that's not my expertise and, and actually looks quite complicated. So, but really you could work through it uh, on that website and, and uh, knowing about Crohn's as you will do with the condition and see, have you had this or are you on this treatment? And coming back then to the to the letter, um, so the supermarket is is not giving full pay until presenting the letter. the The letter here we're talking about is the shielding letter that the government has sent out. Um, in England, at least, I think in Scotland, that's not yet been sent out or not fully. And it's recognised that the the list is not perfect, and um, it's been again derived from a number of sources. It's not a perfect list, and if you feel that your Crohn's puts you in the severe category, then I think review that information and discuss with work again. Um, I, I think here it's going to be 
more of the Crohn's and the Parkinson's that, that's potentially um, applicable, um, but, but might not be. Okay, thank, thank you very much for, for that, Donald. Um, just to say on, on the letter that is coming out from, from certainly NHS England in, in England, going out to, to people in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, the letters started uh, going out last week. Um, some may have been received, some are still to be received. So if you haven't had a letter yet, um, and you are in, in, in the, the, the kind of the, the categories, um, uh, there, there is advice on the government website, there's advice um, that we can signpost you to on, on the Parkinson's UK website. Um, make sure that you uh, are, are, are checking that. Um, as Donald says, um, if you have another condition, go to uh, their websites and kind of check through um, and, and have those, those conversations with work just to make sure that you are, um, that, that you are kind of in the right category in terms of whether you're shielding or, or, or self-isolating. Um, we, we can talk a little bit more in, in a moment about some of the support that you can get uh, uh, from, from uh, the government um, and also from um, NHS around isolation notes. So um, yeah, I'll just, just move on to, to the next question. Um, I have an appointment with my consultant in the next few weeks. Will these be by phone or will they be cancelled? Well, the answer is that that will vary across the country and, and may change with time as well, depending on how this pans out. Um, so we already know that trainee doctors uh, have been redeployed quite a lot, um, sometimes in response to what's already needed in London sometimes in preparation for what's expected in other parts of the country. Um, I know of some consultants in London who've been redeployed um, already from, say, neurology to support other parts of um, the, the system and of nurses and therapists that have been redeployed as well. So it's possible that um, uh, appointments, routine appointments will be cancelled. Uh, there's the added issue of staff sickness and self-isolating and you'll know from general media reports that there's a, an attempt to um, ramp up testing of healthcare pe personnel who, who may not be infected but are having to self-isolate for safety reasons at the moment. So I think that all of that there then, uh, I mean many services are doing phone calls at, at the present time but I think this could change over the next week or two or three, depending on how much of a surge of um, cases are admitted to hospital with um, a need for acute care for COVID-19 pneumonia. So I, again, t coming back to, to the Parkinson's um, and remembering that a lot of review appointments are routine, they're a check-up. Check up. Um, if you're doing fine, if you're little different from last review six months or a year ago, that's fine. Um, Self-manage and uh, um, it, it, things will get back to their usual service. But if you're not doing well, then um, seek advice and uh, that could be still uh, through your um, usual team uh, in the specialist service um, or your GP um, or, or both. Okay, thank, thank you, Donald. Um, we've got a general question here about pain and Parkinson's. Um, so I have Parkinson's, I can hardly move my right leg. I'm in a lot of pain, what can I do? Yes, thank you. So that, that's actually quite a common symptom and um, it, it's mostly not the Parkinson's, it's mostly wear and tear in the spine. It's a bit of nerve nipping um, or sciatica. And there's a set of questions that, that um, I, I would ask the person about that. Um, past history of, of back trouble, of sciatica, of, of um, needing episodic increase in painkillers uh, to deal with that. It's often uh, or even usually self-limiting and settles if it's of that cause. Um, uh, is the person taking painkillers at the moment? Can they uh, get stronger ones? Um, they might need 
prescription for strong lungs. And I think um, it raises, it's a helpful question in making me think, right, what, what should people do? Um, someone with Parkinson's and they've got new symptoms. And it's not really Parkinson's symptoms, but as far as a person can tell, how, how should they deal with them? Well, if it's not, if it's not a set of symptoms that point to COVID-19, then contacting the general practice is the, um, the way forward. And much of that is done by telephone uh, or video link presently to reduce the risk to both the person and, and the doctor uh, of transmitting COVID-19. Um, some limited face-to-face -face consultations are still going ahead. We're absolutely essential. If, uh, of course, if, the, if your new symptoms that aren't Parkinson related are, are the, the dry cough and the fever, then uh, self-manage if you can, follow the guidance that's um, well publicized about what the symptoms are and, and how to self-manage um, and know the categories of contacting NHS um, 24 uh, if, if you are developing more severe symptoms or not improving. Um, and, and then, and we've covered this earlier in a couple of the other questions about Parkinson management. If it's, if it's the Parkinson's itself and there's a need to adjust treatment, then, um, then specialist contact with the consultant or team, the specialist nurse, um, and always supported by our fantastic general practice service. These are the, the ways forward. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Donald. Um, and the, the final question that, that we've had in um, is uh, from somebody who works in retail. They have Parkinson's. They st still need to go out to work to pay their bills. What can they do? Um, so Parkinson's, as Donald has, has um, mentioned earlier on, is, is not on uh, the, the the high vulnerability um, category and so people with the condition generally won't be shielding. Um, so if you are encouraged to stay home you will get a letter um, that you can share with your employer. Um, so I think there's about 1.8 million letters going out to households um, or to people across the, the, the UK. Um, as, as Donald suggested in the other um, question uh, a moment ago, um, it's important to speak to your employer about your concerns and possibly what protections they can put in place for, for you. Um, as as um, you know, we've said, if you do start to show symptoms, then you should follow the advice and obviously self-isolate. Um, you can get an isolation note if you've been off work for 14 days through the NHS website um, or NHS 111 online. Um, just to know that, that for the first seven days that you are off work, you won't need to provide a note. Um, if you go on to gov.uk, um, it has all of this information. Um, this information was updated on the 20th of, um, of March. Um, there, there is also information on that website about, um, uh, about claiming um, universal credit and, and how you can do that and any other support that you might need um, at this point in time. Um, but the, the final plea really is if you do have any queries, don't hesitate to contact our helpline. Um, so, so that number again is 0808 800 0303. Um, and also keep up to date with uh, the information on our website, so that's parkinsons.org.uk and don't hesitate to, to join the, the Facebook group um, that, that we have set up, the, the new Facebook group. Um, I don't know, Donald, if there was any kind of closing remarks that you've got around uh, living with um, Parkinson's uh, while people are, are kind of at home and isolated at this moment in time. Um, and then we'll just, we'll just wrap up. Yes, I, I mean, just to, uh, my general sort of take home message is that um, be, be reassured that Parkinson's is not increasing your risks of of um, problems um, enormously. We're, we're all anxious about this. It's uncharted territory.
country for, for or a pandemic in, in our lifetimes, all of our lifetimes. Uh, um, so, and again, anxiety can be a part of Parkinson's and can be provoked by this sort of thing. And that's, that's understandable, but um, uh, there isn't a need for your anxiety level to be hugely elevated by having uh, Parkinson's actually. And um, there's a whole army of people um, working in the Parkinson's arena, um, all of these people in Parkinson's UK, um, all of the healthcare professionals uh, are working quite often behind the scenes as well as in front of them and, um, and supporting you and will continue to do so. We'll adjust as we need to and shift some of that resource over to acute care. Um, if we get this increased surge of people with um, COVID-19 active infections um, and that will come and that will go and then we, we'll get back to our more usual service and, and, um, and return to normal life. Okay, thank, thank you so much for, for, for that, Donald. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you everybody for, for sending in your questions and for, for watching. And again, one final plea, do continue to keep up to date with all of the activities that we've got on our website, parkinsons.org.uk. Um, and if you do have queries or you have concerns, um, contact our helpline 0808 800 0303. Thank you very much and uh, take care of yourselves.